Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. Let's begin uh, with a quick show of hands. Uh, this is the Link NYC. And I'm, I'm just wondering, how many of you guys have seen this on your way here today? All right, sweet. Actually, I was expecting like everyone, but uh, I'll take 60-ish percent. Well, um, congratulations for the folks who have seen it. Um, you have experienced what we call an out-of-home advertisement. So this is dystopia, but put another way, it's a really good example of what out-of-home means. Out of home is arguably the oldest form of advertisement that exists. It, it goes back to uh, the simplest type of advertisement th that you can, can think of, which is go ahead and make a sign, stand in a corner where you know people will walk around and hope that they will read it. Now, t in today's world, anything that exists outside of, say, your mobile application or your smart connected TV counts as an out-of-home advertisement. And at Place Exchange, what, we, what we're doing is we're bringing the world of programmatic advertisements to the out-of-home space. So in here, this is an example of an actual programmatic ad um, that showed up in a billboard on the side of, I don't really drive, so I don't know what the, uh, the interstates mean, but it's, it's on the side of a big highway in uh, Philadelphia. Now, the way this works is programmatic advertisements. What that means is when you go to the Times, nytimes.com, or any sort of large blogish kind of site, um, it's that thing that, that pops up in between the content itself. And the way it works is it is transacted. It is purchased and, and displayed programmatically, as in there isn't a sales team involved per se. And so as you can see here, what we're doing is we're bringing that paradigm, but to street side ads. And arguably, the biggest driver as to why we want to do this is that it will allow us to bring useful content to these screens. Um, and, these, and these useful pieces of content can be paid for by the programmatic advertisements, which allows for more interesting and ideally useful pieces of, of information to show up as we commute into work or, or drive down the street, et cetera. And so actually, as it stands today, uh, Link NYC does this already. Um, if you have walked down the street and are from, um, from NYC um, and you've seen the current train status, that's an example of how a useful piece of content can be, be displayed on an, on an out-of-home ad. The one caveat is that that does cost. It has an actual cost factor, which you can't really represent without having some sort of advertisement to pay for it. And that's kind of what Place Exchange is bringing to the table. Now, the way we're doing this is, um, if you look here, so this is a few screen formats that we have of a, of a screen. It could be a billboard. It could be a whole plethora of stuff. And what we're doing is, here's some examples of how a programmatic ad can be taken. And, and, and you know, programmatic ads are meant for the mobile web and scaled and wrapped around you know, things like the current, uh, it's 89 degrees. Um, actually, I don't think this is for today. But it feels that way, right? And so what it'll do is it'll actually go ahead and uh, take the, the useful content, wrap it around some sort of programmatic advertisement, and then justify the cost of being able to, to display this. And so the biggest problem, the way we do this, is we take some sort of screen that exists. We take characteristics of that screen. And our platform will translate it to the equivalents that exist in the programmatic world. So if you can imagine, before you display an ad on the Times, there might be a bunch of characteristics you might want to take into account. And in the same manner, before you display an ad on a billboard, there's a bunch of characteristics that you might want to also take into account. So what we do at Place Exchange is we, we perform that translation 
so that mobile buyers, people who want to buy advertisements for the Times, etc., can also buy it on our screens. Or um, these days, uh, omnichannel it has become a thing. So when we say omnichannel, they could also potentially buy it for connected TVs and things like that. So now, the major problem is this. Has anyone ever seen this XKCD? It's one of my favorites. So basically, the idea is that there are competing standards. And so then someone goes, let's go big, make you know, our own, and now you have n plus one competing standards. And so when we first started Place Exchange, we focused on delivering programmatic advertisements to our uh, link inventory. And we have a whole bunch of those all around NYC. So that was actually kind of easy, right? Because we know how our links work. We know what characteristics, what capabilities they, they provide. And so it, was, it, it, was, it wasn't too hard to take that and transform that into the mobile advertising world. The problem started when we tried to scale from just one publisher, if you will, to multiple publishers. So for instance, if you look here, uh, these are a few examples of additional inventory types that we currently support uh, at Place Exchange today. So for instance, if you look there, uh, I don't know if you guys have ever, have ever seen this, but uh, uh, Vengos are these mobile vending machine apps. Um, they're pretty neat, but they seem to sell a lot of earphones, but they also have a whole bunch of other stuff. And right there is a programmatic ad that was delivered through Place Exchange. Um, if you look here, this is a screen on some sort of airport, I'm not sure which, which again has a bunch of screens that may or may not have content always, and that can now be leveraged to, to display ads itself. Now the problem here, though, is there's a whole bunch of different screens. They're, they're managed by a whole bunch of different publishers who may or may not have started at a whole bunch of different points in time. And because we are dealing with disparate hardwares, what we end up with is this problem of varying screen context. All right, so I'm going to use this this really neat trick that was just um, shown to me. Oh, look at that. How cool is this, right? Uh, so I wanted to highlight uh, two pieces, really. So these are all valid. And I, this is a little bit, um, I, I, I want to say 80% of these, of these screen types are currently supported by our platform. But to be clear, uh, here is a train station deployment, as we call it, versus an in-building elevator deployment. Now, the thing they have in common is both of them have the ability to request an ad and some sort of interesting content from our platform. The hard thing is that that's the only thing that they have in common. Uh, it's really hard, especially if you, if you see um, an ad like this, where you might have a giant screen on the lobby. You might have smaller screens within the elevators themselves. And they may or may not have the same connectivity characteristics. Right? So they might, not, they might be wired to LTE, maybe not, et cetera. The same goes for the train station. Moreover, the duration also is really not a, a, a normalized at all, because here people are probably on the elevator for a short period of time, whereas uh, as the MTA is, um, can show us, trains come few and far between. right? So that's one problem. right? So here's one example of fragmentation in the system that we have to contend with. Moving forward, I, uh, we'll, I kind of jammed two things in here. The one piece is that if you look, if you direct your attention to these guys, uh, it's also important to note that a screen might not be completely available to us uh, in order to, to display the ad. So the content space that we have allocated might actually be very uh, different from the actual space available. And beyond that, not all of our screens are static as in something that you can see from far away. A billboard would, would fit that bill. However, ah, billboard bill. Uh, but what wouldn't is something like a touch screen, uh, a device, where you might actually have to stop your ad when someone starts to interact with it, and so on and so forth. So here on out again, we, have, we are contending with additional fragmentation. Now, how do we solve this, right? And our solution was kind of like, hey, but you know what? Let's let the people who want to integrate uh, with us solve this problem for us. So what we did is, to, to try to isolate complexity, we shifted away this, this act of entity uh, management as far to the client side as possible. So what that means is, our publisher partners, they have a really good sense of how their screens work. 
they have a really good sense of the, the data pieces that we require that they have off the bat or, or that they can pull from their screens or that they need to provide through some other means. So what we did is we developed an API-first approach that would define flexible abstractions and taxonomies to normalize most of these inventory attributes so that regardless of which type of deployment comes in, to us, it always kind of looks like that, a PX model, which is something that we have uh, defined and that we, we maintain the specification for, which goes back to the standards piece. Now, the idea here is that, just remember, this is just the beginning of the, of the entirety of, our, of the uh, system itself. So this has to actually be translated once again to the OpenRTB spec. Uh, OpenRTB stands for uh, the Open Real-Time uh, uh, Bidding Spec, and what that is, effectively, is that's what the mobile um, providers of advertisements want or look at when we attempt to get an ad uh, from them. So what we're doing here is, first we create this uh, uh, normalization process, then because we know what these things are, we can translate it to the OpenRTB model, then we use that to actually make our API calls to retrieve bids, which then we can send back to these guys to, uh, uh, to render and do all sorts of additional processing. Now, having said that, and having solved the problem of taking multivariate IoT clients and uh, normalizing them, I want to focus now on how the rest of our you know, architecture works. So here, we have what I call a a logical diagram. What that means is this will, this diagram showcases the guts of what we call the ad request uh, flow, if you will. So this architecture, um, it's quite important. So the ad request is basically the entry point that says, hey, please give me an advertisement because I want to, I, I want to show something. And so basically 100% of our, of our traffic starts here, right? And the few key things to call out here is that once we've done our, uh, um, the act of taking all of the, the data pieces and uh, normalizing it, this becomes really easy, and then this stuff becomes super interesting. And it's worth noting that the entirety of this architecture is, one, built on AWS uh, infrastructure, and two, it is entirely, quote unquote, a serverless. And what we mean by that, by the term serverless here, is that we try to rely on managed service um, as much as possible. Uh, we prefer solutions that have a pay-as-you-go model. And most importantly, we, our entire, the whole architecture here is a series of Lambda functions that are triggered either off of you know, event inputs like API gateway invocations or produces data for Kinesis streams or consumes data from other streams and then kind of does that over and, 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 and over again until we get to the downstream, which is basically a bunch of information that we can store and structure and so forth. Now, I want to show you guys another representation of this which is a little bit more granular, right? So, so this is sort of a high level, hey, an ad request comes in, we make, an, uh, we go ahead and we try to understand what that means. We send off a bid request, which will give us a bunch of bids. We perform an auction. Uh, this creative approval is basically a way for us to validate that the creatives that come in are street safe, which is a really big deal, especially in the out of home markets. We actually have a, have a human to take a look at each creative and either approve it or not. And then once all that stuff is good, it goes back and it shows up as an ad. Now, to show this again in a slightly different manner is this here. So this is the same diagram, but now through the infrastructure bits. And in particular, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna walk through each one and kind of slowly point out a, a couple of the interesting pieces and caveats to this architecture. So here's the ad request, a bunch of stuff happens, we get to there where it's sort of our uh, data sync where we have a bunch of information. So let's begin with, our, with this piece right here, which is the data collection API endpoint. And so when we say data, we really mean 
entity uh, uh, um, information about the screen itself. So the slot height, the width, how long it can stay, things like that. Um, that's what we really mean by the data portion. So that happens by an API gateway uh, invocation, which will trigger the first of a bunch of uh, uh, Lambda functions. Now, this Lambda will interact with a bunch of other APIs, and it does a few other things, which we're not really going to go into yet. But the important thing is that once it's done, once it collects all the bids, it performs the auction, it performs the, the validation on the bid responses to ensure quality of the creatives and so forth, it will drop a log record to a Kinesis stream. Now, that Kinesis stream, uh, well, he's got a whole lot of stuff um, that goes on in his life, and we're not there yet. But the one thing to point out is that we, can, we optionally do point a bunch of consumer lambdas to it as a means to perform additional work on the, the data that we did uh, uh, log. So in this example, uh, this goes back to what we had here, uh, oopsies, here, where, uh, oh, time for my trusty friend. This creative process actually reads off of the case stream itself. So every time new ads come in, we use that lambda to say, hey, grab it and submit it somewhere for the approval process. Now, as we move along this process, once the data has been logged to a Kinesis stream, the next step is here, this blue box in this, in this uh, corner. And what we need to do is we take our log records and we actually have fire hoses, and two of them actually. Uh, one that encodes all this, this content and drops it into a parquet format into an S3 bucket, and one more that does the same but through the JSON format. And we have Glue. Glue is a managed uh, extract transform load service that will, which we use to define the schema for our uh, data formats. And what we have is the, uh, you know, Athena will then take a look at the Glue schema, and we can use that to run pay-as-you-go uh, SQL queries for the generation of uh, looker reports or Tableau reports, etc. And that's kind of how this entire the the data flow of the entire uh, system works. The other piece to talk about is our friend down here. And so, once our uh, our data comes in, we perform the uh, we drop the log and we do all that stuff. We also want to be able to keep track of observability. So logs, uh, metrics, et cetera. And so the way we do it is we actually have a CloudWatch um, subscription uh, a filter, which is basically a lambda. And what this lambda will do is it will read through the log level statements, perform a little bit of processing, and pass it along to a, a multitude of logging uh, services. Um, we have two right now. We might have five in the future, I, you know, I'm not really sure. But that's kind of the process for this piece. And what this does for us is this concludes at least how the ad requests um, system architecture works. And so a quick recap. The key technologies that we are using here is API Gateway uh, to handle on-demand like, web requests. Kinesis streams for asynchronous data processing and um, basically being able to, to log all the stuff that the system is ingesting. Glue as an ETL service. Uh, CloudWatch logs for efficient metrics and logging management. And of course, lambdas to stitch together all the stuff that is occurring at each one of these infrastructure points. Now, the next piece to talk about here is how we integrate observability across our application stack. And so we do leverage uh, 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 Datadog um, in order to record all of our uh, metrics, both the stuff that comes out of the box and stuff for system performance and so forth, but also the business level um, pieces that are useful in order to kind of understand in a higher level, hey, is this thing doing what we expect it to? So I'm going to spend some time to, uh, going through each one of these. And first, uh, I do want to talk about how we perform client-side uh, 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 monitoring, in particular because a lot of these screens are publisher-based, right? And so they, again, run on a whole variety of client-based um, 
systems and platforms. So what we've done is we've built a small JS-based library uh, that wraps around the uh, Datadog's uh, HTTP a, uh, you know, API. And what that does is it allows publishers, should they want to, to pass us this information. And for at least one of our publishers, they do, they do use um, this to pass along information like, hey, did the creative run? Do we make an ad request and so forth? Now, going into the other aspect, um, how we perform observability on the back end. Um, so as I mentioned, Datadog is really nice because it does pass along stuff like the basic AWS uh, metrics uh, that are available, but through DD itself. So here's some examples of what happened in the last week. So uh, we did get throttled a couple of times, so I think that's a good thing. Uh, just means that we are at, at scale, which is great. Um, this was a really interesting metric. It basically tells us if the Lambda consumer is falling behind the availability of the uh, log level events in the K stream or not. And so it looks like we fell behind a little bit, but like not too bad. Now, the more interesting piece are the business level metrics. So I kind of want to talk about a couple of them just to give some context as to how we use these uh, uh, metrics at Place Exchange. So as far as that goes, we have bid filter uh, logic. So basically what that means is even if a DSP will provide us a bid, we might, not, we might choose not to display it for a multitude of reasons. And so the way that works is uh, we have an enum-based set of reasons that we encode. And every time we hit one of those, we just fire off one metric. And this way, we can keep track, and we can say, like, oh, hey, it looks like a lot of these creatives are being rejected. What's going on? Let's go take a look. That being said, uh, the number of auctions like recorded is a good way to say, hey, how, how well is the system performing? Like, are, are, like, how, the number of auctions will tell us how much throughput the system is being, is being able to process. So again, spikes are, are, are really interesting, um, and troughs are scary, but also interesting. Now, with that being said, um, what's really interesting here is that the Kinesis Stream batch size metrics are things that we had to come up with because we actually ran into a lot of Kinesis constraints as we started to, to scale about a couple of months ago. And what that led to was like, oh, hey, we actually don't have a lot of good observability in how long it takes for us to read a one batch from a Kinesis on average. Or, hey, like, we should take a look at how long it takes to write a batch to Kinesis because that could inform us if we should you know, increase the number of shards or, or something to that effect. And then on the client side, um, the two things that are, are super uh, important or interesting are acknowledgments that the creative did show up, and then also uh, a list of how many ad requests were made because we can use those two numbers to come up with a decent ratio to understand how well the ads are actually being properly uh, uh, delivered. Now, with all of this data, what we really like, to, what we usually do is we have all of these, these metrics, and we will publish dashboards. Dashboards are awesome because what they do is they create this concept of what we call an information uh, 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 furnace. And an information furnace is basically systems that will radiate information across the board versus ha having someone to go ahead and try to find it. Because it's hard to know what kind of information you want to know, even. So what we do is we take these guys, and we post them all over, or if not all over, in key places where the sales team, the prod team, the engineering team happen to walk by. And what we found is that it actually creates a lot of useful back and forth. Like, oh, hey, what does this mean? Or, hmm, this spike seems interesting. What's going on there? And as you can see here, we can conglomerate both the client side stuff in addition to the, uh, the back end application stack layer stuff. And so that sort of concludes how the, the, the observability part works, right? So this is how we can flow information and uh, knowledge of the overall plus, like, hey, is it working or not, um, characteristics of our architecture. So what I'm going to do, do next is I'm going to talk about some fun constraints that we ran up against as we built out and scaled this architecture. And what's the one caveat to kind of call out now is that a lot of the constraints you can you know, go on Stack Overflow and, and find. So I'm going to stick to the ones that were like really interesting in that 
we weren't able to easily find solutions to them. And, and, and quite frankly, the solutions we came up with are like, oh, trade-offs. Like, we have this little dance we do, and it really means like, oh, well, there isn't a really good solution here, but based on what we, what's really important and what we can sort of concede, we'll go with this approach. So the first one has to do with collecting uh, the, observab the observability uh, metrics from the uh, lambda functions. And in particular, typically the way this works is you have some sort of a daemon, statsd. Um, we use dog statsd, or like, like we would use that, right, um, for uh, a data dog. And, and typically, the way this works is we send a bunch of you know, observation stuff. And based on the host name, it can get deduped and, and, and sort of processed. The issue, though, is when it comes to lambdas, they, uh, there's, no good, there's no concept, there's no equivalent of a, of a host name for a Lambda invocation. Because it kind of scales based on what, what AWS wants to do and based on your load and so on and so forth. So the problem is that, that actually will like, result to uh, metrics um, per Lambda potentially overriding each other, especially as you scale up and you have multiple invocations. And the other thing is that you know, a Lambda will live at most for, for 15 minutes, and that's like, like a new thing, right? Uh, I think that happened maybe in March. So before that, it was even sh shorter time, period, like 10 minutes or something, something to that effect. And so that is problematic. Beyond that, what we were doing prior was we were actually performing a, a manual flush. So once our Lambda invocation was done, that's when we would take the collected uh, metrics and, and, and push it through some sort of HTTP API. And so if we were to, and so that like, resulted in a whole bunch of problems where our metrics weren't actually matching what we expected. So we went through a bunch of, of loops, and this was like a, a pretty long process. But what we eventually ended up on was, um, in the nick of time, Datadog actually introduced a, a, a feature called the Distribution Metrics API. And what that did was it actually allowed us to decide on this particular architecture which lets us write our own CloudWatch subscription uh, a filter, process those logs as I mentioned, and then pass them along to the distribution metrics API versus having to rely on StatsD or what have you. And so you know, the main pros of that is just that, one, there's no need to make those HTTP calls again uh, at the end of the Lambda invocation, which is really nice. Uh, it is an asynchronous process. It, it operates on batches, so we can either have it on the subscription filter lambda or for our consumers of the K, of the K streams, we can just, just pass it along, which is nice. Uh, but if we do make use of the CloudWatch subscription filter, we're only allowed one subscription filter per log group. And this might change in the future. It's an AWS-specific constraint, so hopefully in the future it, it will maybe be like five or something, or something we can ask to increase. But that means that if we have n uh, logging services, you have one lambda to uh, approach all of them, which is a little gross, hence the dance. So with that being said, another interesting uh, constraint that we ran up against was dependency size limits. So a typical lambda dependency artifact will allow you 50 megs of space um, zipped. And as soon as your lambdas become like more than just toys, they, it, it, that grows in a lot of interesting ways. And so the question was, well, how do we, how do we get around that? How do we make that work? And there's, a, and there's no one solution. There's a couple of things we could do, and I kind of want to talk about a few. The first is don't package your AWS modules. Um, for example, Boto, if you're using a Python, for instance. That comes, as, that comes free as part of the Lambda environment, so there's no reason to include those. And so that helps a, a bit, but not too much. The other thing you can do is uh, all lambdas come with a TMP uh, uh, folder per invocation, which actually gives you 512 megs of space, which is nice. And so what you can do is, if you can get your deployment package size to under 50 megs, you could theoretically take that uncompress it as often as you, as you have to, and stick it into the TMP folder and point your, your dependency path to it. And that does give you 
10 times the, the, uh, the amount of space, which is nice. However, it will eat up runtime in this thing that we call cold start. So every time a Lambda invocation starts up, what happens is it has to you know, initialize all the, all, all, the, all the stuff from your dependencies and your code itself. And so if, we, if you have to unzip and move and point as part of your start time, that will take up real time, which can potentially, especially at load, lead to some measurable latency problems. So this is a potentially, like you might have to do this, you might not have, have no choice, but this is uh, a constraint you will want to or need to, con to contend with. The other thing, um, which is really for Python specific lambdas that I wanted to call out, is this is a, a, a clever trick really. Um, wow, that's really large. But basically here's a small script, and what this really does is it acknowledges that in order to run Python, all you need is your .pyc files. So what you can do is you can just walk through and get rid of all the other stuff, the docs, the pi files, the tests. And that actually, for us, was what made things stabilized for the time being. We got a lot of um, a benefit in that regard, in that the size shrunk a lot. And, that, and, and so that's kind of the, the, the current solution that we, are, are, that we have um, currently in production. Now, with that being said, the next sort of fun constraint in, in, this, uh, in the story here is uh, caching. Now, simple caching techniques, like naive caching techniques, don't really work very well when it comes to Lambda invocations. And there's a few reasons for that. So why don't we consider um, the cache control Python module, which has various subclasses which will allow you to cache according to a bunch of different constraints. So the simplest is, of course, in memory caching, which you can use the dict cache class for. It's in memory, which is nice. It's uh, simple. But just remember that at load, multiple Lambda invocations are initialized, right? So what that means is, or rather instances. So if there's a ton of load on your API gateway, AWS might spin up like 100 or 1,000 Lambda environments, each that run like your code individually. Which means that if you rely on this caching uh, mechanism, what that will result in is the same thing will, might potentially get, get cached a thousand times. And remember, especially for like API Gateway, those don't live that long, right? I mean, again, long in the world of Lambda is 15 minutes, but like those still don't live that long. And so what we found out was um, things got really expensive super quickly, especially for API calls that we were paying for. So the clear way to fix this is, OK, why don't we go ahead and use a persistent uh, caching layer? So of course, a Redis, memcache, something like that comes to mind. And that is nice. And that would be, in, in any other use case, like, OK, like that's it. Like, we're done. Awesome. But the problem is that t t typically, um, memcache, uh, Redis, et cetera, they usually live you know, behind a, a VPC. And as it turns out, connecting to a VPC from a Lambda, a Lambda instance while possible, is not a easy task in terms of performance. In particular, uh, the way it works is you need an elastic network interface to connect to the VPC from the Lambda invocation. But the act of creating and connecting to one per invocation could end up taking a, like, way more time than you might want to be able to afford. And so that, and now, like, I should say that um, there is a solution in the works um, that AWS uh, announced last December. However, it, from our experience, it didn't seem very like, robust just yet. And for that reason, um, it was something that we just could not like, work with. And so what we ended up doing was we said, OK, let's try to find potentially other ways to solve the same problem. So you know, you know, other DBs that we could use. And uh, we, we took a look at two in particular. Uh, we ended up going with DynamoDB, mainly because it supports a uh, time to live garbage collection operation, like right you know, out of the box. Whereas if we use Elasticsearch, we'd have to spin up another Lambda to perform a cron to walk through and clear this out, which is just more complexity that we didn't you know, want to incur. And so this approach works out pretty well, but I wanted to uh, show some caveats. This is just a, a diagram of how cache works honestly. Um, but the, 
the main two caveats to, to call out here are one, when it comes to garbage collection, um, Dynamo supports a global TTL, which means that you might have to have multiple tables per cache type, which for us, we, like, we just decided, like, hey, here are the three things that we really need to cache, and we, and we focused on those. But if you have a whole bunch, that might be problematic or might require additional software or, or um, code or logic to encode. That's one. The other thing is, um, and this is really specific to us, but uh, when it comes to how we provision these pieces, we prefer to use Ansible. And the pay-as-you-go feature just got released recently. And as a result, it's not supported in any official Ansible module yet. It might be true for any other type of uh, infrastructure as code service that you might use. So we actually had to, to roll our own, which again is something that like, okay, in a, in a few days it'll be fine, or in a few weeks or a few months, but like right now it's kind of like, hey, let's acknowledge, let's tech that, and let's move on. Which is kind of the theme when it comes to um, a lot of these pieces. And so the final thing I wanted to talk about is nested schema evolution. Um, and so let's kind of you know, dig deep into this and talk about what the heck that means, really. So what we like to do is we like to over-eagerly log data um, when it comes to a lot of our processing, mainly because you know, we're about a, you know, a year and a half old. And so it just helps to have more logs um, in order to debug or troubleshoot and things like that. right? So it's, it's really nice um, to be able to do that. And we wanted to use Apache Parquet as our format for the log records, mainly because um, it is quite efficient for logging and the way, um, space efficient rather, and the way Athena works is, is you do pay per terabyte of data scanned. And so anywhere where we can get some compression is, is a win because it directly results to $2 saved. And will allow us to continue to be over, over eager until you know, we can't be anymore for practical reasons. The main problem though is, you know, as stated, we are starting off. We, we're only a year and a half in, and so our data models do evolve. And while not super frequently, it does, it does occur on a cadence of like you know, every month or every six weeks. The problem though is, and this is a known, a known problem, uh, PrestoDB is what Athena uses um, in the background. And it does not support nested schema evolution um, in Parquet, which means that historical data um, after a model um, has been updated is no longer available. And so this PR actually has been closed. Um, it's been open for a while. It, it was closed a couple of months ago. But the way the cadence works is Athena hasn't pulled it in yet because they have their own schedule for this. And so right now, we're kind of like waiting. And in the meantime, what, what we've decided to do is we've acknowledged that while this is problematic, we're going to log both formats, both Parquet and as a JSON, with the idea that if our Parquet queries do fail, we can fall back to the more expensive JSON equivalent. But ideally, that won't happen as often. Um, and then once the once this change does get pushed into Athena itself, we can sort of close out this piece and, and, and we'll be left with the format that we prefer. But again, this is one of those, this is the best we can do at, at the current moment. And so with that being said, that sort of concludes the really interesting stuff that we had to scratch. Uh, like it took like, like most of these, these uh, um, stories, I guess, uh, took a couple of weeks or a couple of sprint cycles to, to get to agreement on. And they'll probably evolve as time goes on. Um, but a few key takeaways that I wanted to, to talk through. Uh, I got about two minutes left, it looks like. Uh, you know, the first thing is kind of that, um, was it worth it? Uh, so it, if I had the option to re-architect this thing, um, or I was starting to make something again with this, like would I use these uh, serverless frameworks or, or architecture style? And I think the answer is yes, absolutely. Uh, mainly because while there are, you know, these constraints are definitely interesting, the, the cost savings, like per month, our, our average spend on prod is actually not as bad as we had, we had thought it would be. And the pay-as-you-go model has been really great. I think the other thing is that when it comes to like serverless, and, and this could be a whole other talk, but the way you test and the way you organize your code had, involves different paradigms. And I personally think that those paradigms are good because they force better coding practices. And so as a result, I feel like our code is more stable. And we 
over like rely on on testing because we don't have like a, oh it works on my machine type of uh, view because there is no my machine right it all is on, on AWS um, the other thing is I should point out that not everything should be done in a serverless and it's really important to acknowledge what thing what items need to be server full if you will versus serverless right um, and a, a large swaths of our architecture stuff that we haven't talked about here um, actually do like rely on your typical Django apps and, and so on and so forth because it just makes sense to the final thing that I wanted to talk about is when it comes to observability, right? Like, how do you know what to observe? And the way we, the process that we took is we kind of went with like, hey, here's these large key metrics that we think are important. Let's throw them up somewhere. Let's keep them up there for a while. Let's walk around. And as people start to ask questions, let's come back and let's try to find more specific things or as problems appear. Let's go ahead and, 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 and fix it there. And wow, that was perfect timing, because I am done. Thank you, everyone. Um, and I wanted to share, uh, end with a picture of my cat, um, who wants some coffee, as I do, too. Thank you. <laughs>